G'day ladies and gents and welcome to, well, you'd be forgiven for thinking this is War Thunder, but it's not. This is IL-2 Stormovic, the Battle of Stalingrad. The most recent patch has just dropped on IL-2, and something that I most certainly was not expecting has been introduced to the game. We now have Mouse Aim. Now, this is likely going to cause two reactions. One, half of you are going to be ecstatic at the fact that you can now fly the game on mouse. The other half are going to be disgusted that a simulation put it in. So I'm going to address both of these. First, for those who are looking forward to it personally, I think this is a good thing too. Don't worry, sim guys, it's not going to affect your game mode, and I'll explain why later. Part of the problem with simulation games previous to were really previous to War Thunder, any real hardcore simulations. They had a very niche audience. It was very hard for developers to make large amounts of money, especially if they wanted to develop a long-term product that they wanted to expand on over time, which it's pretty clear at this point with the first expansion pack, Battle of Moscow, well under development, uh, planes already released for it, such as the E7 that you see on screen right now, and additional aircraft and obviously additional plans for expansions into other areas of World War II combat, that that's exactly what they want to do. But there is no premium accounts, there is no real free-to-play elements inside of IL-2. You get the base game which you purchase, and then there's two premium aircraft that you can purchase for the game that cost about $15 each, and that's it. If you buy both those planes and the base game, you have just supported uh, 777 Studios and 1C Studios development of uh, IL-2 Stormovic, the Battle of Stalingrad, to the best of your ability. Since a simulation product tends to have a very small market, that's a very limited amount of income. Adding in a mouse aim option opens the market to a more casual player base. These casual players will buy the same packs that you do as a simulation player, and as a result, 1C makes more money, 777 makes more money, and they are able to expand their development hire new people on, bring everything in more depth. So expanding into a more casual market is a great idea. And this is probably the best way to do it. Removing the need for particular peripherals that you wouldn't already have, such as joysticks, removing the need for track IR, and allowing a mouse aim control. Providing, of course, that the quality of the flight models for the simulation guys and the simulation gameplay hasn't been sacrificed. And it hasn't but we'll discuss that in just a moment. Now, first things we need to do is have a couple of discussions about how the mouse aim actually works in this. At the moment I am playing in normal mode. Mouse aim is available in normal and expert mode, so that would be, uh, if you wanted to do a comparison against War Thunder, that would be realistic and sim modes. It's not as good as the one in War Thunder. In fact, it's actually pretty bad. There are no keyboard binds for you to manually control, uh, pitch roll, yaw. Everything is controlled by the mouse. There is no controls that are transferred off onto the keyboard. So you can, tr you can basically fly the aircraft completely on the mouse without touching almost anything else short of hitting the G key or so on in order to pull up your landing gear or deploy your flaps. The mouse roller operates the throttle. Holding right mouse button allows you to rotate around the aircraft and look around the outside. And it's not very smooth. There seems to be some kind of uh, automation in play having a look at it from inside of the cockpit here, and it is as awkward to fly. If, if you've ever tried flying mouse aim from inside of the cockpit, you'll know it feels a little awkward. It's just as awkward here. The mouse aim component is... It, it seems to have some kind of automation, sort of like an instructor operating, but it's nowhere near as good as the one that Gaijin have refined for War Thunder. I have to make the comparisons against War Thunder here. I mean, look at the ring. I mean, look at the way it operates. It's... Basically the core of it here is, as you know, there's three different flight models inside of War Thunder. You've got your arcade, your realistic, and your sim flight model. Sim flight model is supposed to be the more complex version. In IL-2 there is only a sim flight model. The realistic flight model exists because it makes it easier for the instructor to control the aircraft for mouse aim within realistic. That's why they keep saying that realistic mode is designed for mouse operation. In IL-2, they don't appear to have another flight model. You play on the full flight model and you either choose to have the normal options enabled, in which case the aircraft auto-manages its systems, or you choose to have the expert options enabled, in which case you have to manage the aircraft systems as well. But there is no simplistic flight model. This lack of sacrificing of flight model complexity means that the aircraft tends to rock around a little bit. As you can see here, it sort of jerks and jumps as it goes through its turns. Now, I have no doubt that they'll probably refine whatever system that they're using to 
translate mouse movement into the aircraft's movement over time and it will get a lot smoother over time. They will probably even put into some keyboard binds allowing you to take over certain systems with the keyboard as well. But no sacrifices in flight model quality have been made in order to make this system run smoother. It's clear that uh, the developers at this point seem to be going the hard path. Keeping a complex flight model and trying to write an automation program that will translate the mouse movements to the control surfaces of the more complex flight model without resorting to the shortcut of actually making a more simplistic flight model for that to run to. So to recap this, the control method is still a little clunky at this time, but this is an experimental uh, control method. This is the first time it's ever been available to the public. It is definitely in need of some work, but I can only see this as being a good thing. I did find that providing you weren't too aggressive on the mouse movement itself, it did allow some really nice control for very low altitude flying. You just needed to be very, very, very gentle with what you were doing. So, to the other side of this, to the hardcore sim guys with your track IR and your hotters, I am one of you guys, you don't need to worry. So, firstly, single player. I've actually seen on certain forum posts here and there people getting really uppity about people not using simulation controls in single player. Honestly, who the hell cares? It doesn't affect how your game is affected at all. If somebody wants to use mouse aim for the single player campaign, let them. Power to them. It's their single player campaign after all. As for multiplayer, the multiplayer servers have already been given the options on whether or not they're going to allow mouse aim or restricted joystick in much the same way that they can control whether or not you're allowed to run on normal settings or you're limited to only expert settings. Pretty much all of the major simulation dedicated multiplayer services in IL2, such as Wings of Liberty server as an example, have already locked mouse aim out. You cannot use them, you cannot join with mouse aim enabled. If you join the Wings of Liberty server, you will automatically be defaulted to expert joystick controls. If you don't have a joystick, you don't get off the runway. So if you stick to the clearly marked sim servers, this will make absolutely no difference to how you are playing IL2 at the moment. It will not affect you at all. What it will do, and this has been something that has disappointed me for a long time, if you look through these servers listings. Now we've got two new official servers, these are the testing for planes and tanks, uh, with mouse aim and tank modes, I'll get onto that in just a moment, hang on. But you'll have a look through the rest of this list, and we finally get down to Wings of Liberty, and it's the first time, we've got 10 people of 84 on at this time, and the rest of the servers are dead, excluding those two test servers, there's only about 3 or 4 people online, between 30 servers. With these changes, it's likely that some of those servers will change over to mouse aim. The new blood coming in will fill up some of those servers. And the really good part for those of you who are into the simulation side is at least some of those new pilots that come in on mouse aim will probably end up translating through to sim. So the community for IL-2 simulation will grow. This has no downsides for you guys. It absolutely doesn't affect you at all if you don't want it to. And potentially it could bring new blood into the game. And of course it'll add new money into the game as well, which will allow the developers to build better quality maps, to add more aircraft into the game, to even improve on the flight models that are already in-game. From a competitive standpoint, outside of whichever way you like to play the game, this is a great thing for everybody that's into this particular genre. I said about a year ago in one of my rather angry, rage-filled vlogs at the time that Gaijin Entertainment and War Thunder really needed to be careful. At the moment, they had the ability to sit on their laurels a little bit because they didn't really have a direct competitor in this genre. There was nobody who was building a semi-realistic flight game that had mouse control that was easily accessible to the general public. Well, as of today, they do. IL-2 Stormovic is now their direct competitor. The only difference with the idea between the two companies is Gaijin came at this particular genre from an arcade standpoint. Small arena orientated battles on very small maps with a large number of aircraft of people to choose from with reasonable FM quality but nowhere near simula true simulation standard. The developers of IL-2 are coming at this from a simulation standpoint with extremely high quality flight models, extremely high quality damage models, extremely well modelled weapons, extremely large maps with realistic flight times, although they don't have a huge amount of variance and they're also coming at it with these large maps with realistic strategic targets and mission objectives. The other main difference between the two of course is that Gaijin came at this from the standpoint of a free-to-play game 
that you would spend money on premium time, you would spend money, so a nice maneuvering kill there, I was pretty impressed with that. Um, you would spend money on for premium time, you would spend money on for premium aircraft in order to grind and unlock new aircraft. Ail2 Stormovic is a purchasable game. You buy the game for an upfront cost. There are two additional premiums that you can purchase if you choose to. There is a unlock system that you have to go through single player in order to unlock particular modifications and components for your aircraft. However, these cannot be purchased for gold. It's playtime in order to unlock these. And if you don't unlock them, it no longer really affects multiplayer as a large number of the multiplayer servers seem to have taken up presets as an option for the way they play. So when you log into the game, you'll have a selection of aircraft that you can choose from, and each of these aircraft will come with a preset level of modifications. And whether or not you have unlocked those modifications in single player to make them available for your multiplayer account or not is entirely irrelevant. You will have them if you select the aircraft for them. And of course in IL-2, you don't need to grind the planes. All the planes in the game are available to you to use from the moment you start playing. So, as I said 12 months ago, War Thunder was eventually going to receive a competitor. It was only a matter of time before somebody chose to take a crack at the rather large, casual, semi-realistic flight sim market that Gaijin Entertainment exposed with War Thunder. He is their first true competitor, and if this is the beta test for their casual flight mode, their mouse aim flight mode, their first test, it's flyable. It's not as refined as War Thunder's, but it is flyable. I expect this is going to be very, very, very popular. God, I love the IL-2 damage models. But that wasn't everything in this particular update. Player-controlled tanks are now available inside of IL-2 Battle of Stalingrad. At the moment, there are only two. We have a T-34 and we have a Panzer III available, and that is it. But they came with a full-blown game mode. What you're seeing on screen right now is... Well, you may have seen it in some of my previous IL-2 videos. The map laid out with the various runways. But you'll notice there's two right on the border, north and south, of the Soviet-German border. Those are actually tank deployment bases. This map is controlled and won by either destroying all the objectives on the ground, as you would in a normal air battle, or by the tanks actually taking one another out and then going out to capture the runways. Have a look at the size of this map. That is a one ground forces map. You can drive your tank anywhere the hell you want on that map. If you want to get over the river, you've got to use the bridges. Want to drive out and capture that far runway? It'll take you about 45 minutes to drive your tank out there, if not more. And you can do it if you want to. Now the tanks in IL-2 play a little bit different as well. For starters, what you see here is driver view you have a proper driver's hatch and tank internals. Now the tank internals are restricted. You can only see what is directly in front of you right now. The camera will not turn more than 45. When under attack, it is advisable to close that hatch because if that hatch is not closed, shells will go straight through it. The tanks can be commanded from three separate positions. There is the driver's position, which you're currently in. There's the gunner's position, which gives you the gunner scope. And then there is a commander's Capola position, which sits your camera just above the top on the turret of your tank. Now, at the moment, the view modes for this are a little funny. While you're driving from driver's view, moving the mouse around will allow you to look around the inside of the tank, at least within the limitations that the camera allows. Once you flick out in either the commander's Capola position or to the gunner's position, which you see here, the um, the gun will always follow your camera. The, t the turret will always turn to follow your camera. There seems to be at least no way that I found where I could turn my head and have... Here's the commander's position. Turn my head and leave the turret aiming in one direction and look in another different direction at the moment. It is possible that I could have missed something in the menus. At the moment, the controls aren't clearly defined as this is basically the first public test of tanks. These are... I'm not even sure these would be even considered beta at this point, I'd probably consider them a public alpha. So once again, there does need to be a little bit of refinement done, but they work. You can drive them, you can fire the cannon, you can shoot other tanks, and they will blow up. The damage models in particular and the detailing in these tanks is actually really impressive. The actual control and the modelling of the tanks themselves probably needs a little bit more refinement. At the moment, they both seem fairly generic to one another with similar turret traverses, similar maximum speeds on the ground, similar hull traverse. 
these were things would be things that would need to be modelled at a later date. This test, I think, for starters, is just about seeing whether or not these things actually work. And you'll notice that to do the test, they've tried to put these tanks straight into combined arms. And it actually works, even with markers on tanks from the air. Because the maps are so large and the player counts are so high, this particular server, just as a test server, can have 54 simultaneous players on it, and there's no restrictions on what people can deploy. I found as a tank, leaving the spawn point and approaching the combat zone, I was largely left alone. Most of the aircraft that were flying past me, for example that Stooker just back there, had already deployed its bombs further up. Ground attack from hostile aircraft became much more common the closer I got to objective areas, but that was, you know, aircraft like the Stuka trying to prevent bases from being captured, flying close air support, which is, you know, precisely what the Stuka was designed to do. And nobody seemed to be too worried about that, since vehicle deployment is unlimited. If you happen to get taken out in any aircraft or any tank, you simply deploy a new one into the battle and keep going until the mission objectives for the battle are completed. There was also a strong element of tactical play, even from the tank side. For example here, I got really smart early on. Driving in the open just made you food for Stukas whenever you started getting close to a combat area where they were bombing in, trying to prevent the capture of one of the German bases. So, well, the trees are still pretty solid here. So I decided to get clever and travel through the forest. Now, despite the fact that I've got a giant red marker on top of my head at the moment, I, I tried tracking tanks from the air on this server, going through the forest like this, and even with the red marker, you can't bloody see the things, they just disappear. Now, at this point, as I'm nicking through the forest, it's time for me to mention frame rates. Now, frame rates on the ground were not particularly great. There was definitely a bit of optimization work that needed to be done. You know, that's hardly surprising, this is an early test. What I found really interesting, however, is driving into a forest like this made absolutely no difference to that frame rate. It still stayed stable. On the full simulation version of tanks, because this would be normal mode, there is still an expert mode for tanks, which has no markers, uh, does not have a third-person camera, it only allows the commander's cupola, the driver's position, and the gunner's position. Basically, sim mode for tanks. If you drove into a forest like this, you would disappear, and it would not affect your frame rate at all. That's pretty impressive from an early test. So last up, let's talk damage models, and this time we've flicked over from the T-34 and we've flicked over to the Panzer III. Now, I want you to take a look at this thing. This was a nice shiny Panzer IV when I started. I'm not destroyed, that's still combat capable. Both my tracks have been blown off and I'm basically disabled at the moment. There's no way to repair the tank. If you lose your tank like that, much like in real life, your tank is immobilized and you just keep fighting until you're destroyed, and then you can deploy a new tank. But what's more, what was done to me here wasn't actually done to me by players, it was done by AI. Because, well, player-controlled tanks are great and all, but because the servers are restricted to at maximum size, I believe the maximum at the moment is 84 players, I don't think I've ever seen a server larger than that. But that's not going to be an epic enough battle, so there is AI on the ground. In fact, all the AI that was available from the air missions that you would traditionally see in an IL-2 air combat game is still there, and there's actually more of it. There is massive swarms of tanks going back and forth that you can slip your tank into and engage in the column, and the AI acts... well... I wouldn't say it's the most intelligent AI in the world, but they do drive in formation, they do keep together, and they do engage targets on site based on threat. I haven't had a chance to actually take it over to expert mode just yet, but I can already envision what it's going to look like. When you're driving one tank amongst maybe 50 or 60 tanks all moving in a formation towards an enemy encampment that you're trying to capture, you know most of those tanks are AI, if not all of them are AI, but it doesn't matter there's 50 or 60 tanks around you and you're moving as a tank platoon. On a map that is at a realistic size, with player-controlled aircraft bombing and shooting the crap out of one another right over the top of your head. World War II combined arms simulations just got a hell of a lot more interesting. Anyways, ladies and gents, I hope you enjoyed the video. Click like if you do, subscribe if you want to see more. Fly smart, fly safe, and I'll catch you in the skies.